But if it keeps going, you may not. You may grow into something. Yeah. I know that's what, probably what he's hoping for. I think it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here this evening. We are in uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 49. And uh, we're finishing up his addressing of the nations. Uh, we talked about Egypt last time. We talked about his words to Moab. Tonight we're going to look at his words to the nation of Ammon, chapter 49. Then his words to Edom. And uh, finish up with uh, those last few verses to some, some of the cities at Elam, which is further over like Hel uh, Babylon or Chaldea. And then we're going to hit, head back to chapter 25 next week where we're going to get back into the historical account. This is right at a time where there's some an, an ambassadors that were coming over to meet with the king, uh, Jeho Jehoiha, or Jehoiakim, and Jeremiah was probably giving them some message. We talked about that last week where he may have handed them the scroll or Baruch may have handed them the scroll. So these messages definitely got, in, I would assume, definitely got in the hands of the kings or the leaders of these countries so they knew what was coming. And that's how the book of Jeremiah begins. That Jeremiah was, God says, you'll be a prophet to the nations. And, and in Jeremiah's lifetime, there was things that were, were moving around. The power was shifting from Assyria to Egypt and then to Babylon. And then even as Jeremiah's time was you know, coming to an end, you know, and Daniel was there, Daniel saw the, the, the rise of the Persians. And then you're going to see all these nations, the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Edomites, Judah, all are being taken down by the Babylonians. And so tremendous turmoil in the Middle East during Jeremiah's day. And the thing is, God called it when Jeremiah was a youth, saying, this is going to be your ministry. You're going to be the prophet to all these nations and tell them ahead of time this is what's going to happen. So again, these ambassadors may have read these words and thought, not a chance that this will happen. In fact, it appears last week when we were reading in chapter 48 that God was almost quoting the, the, the ambassadors or the royalty of, the, of, of, uh, of Moab as they were possibly reading through these, these verses of Jeremiah because it was, it was so shocking to them, they couldn't believe it was taking place. They'd say, this isn't going to happen. We've got, we've got the economy, we've got the military, we've got everything we need to fight something like this off. And yet they're reading it, and it became a testament to those nations as they saw these very things start to transpire, that there was a God in Judah who, who knew these things were taking place. And so now tonight we're going to talk about Ammon and Edom here at first. And we'll get through this chapter, and uh, again... We'll try and draw some things out of it, some information, but basically it's God just telling these nations you're going to be destroyed and uh, telling them some of the details that were very amazing. So let's bow our heads, I'll pray, and then we'll jump into chapter 49 and finish up these set of verses that are addressed to the nations. <laughs> Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you so much for the opportunity to be in a country that's free. We thank you for the opportunity to look into these things and do ask that your spirit would bring them to light in our lives, that we may use them, that we may have a, a direction from your word to, for our times today. We also pray for our country this evening as, as the election results are coming in and ask that we may again see revival in our land, that your hand may be with our people, and that we may have a revival to the word of God in both our nation and in our churches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the year right now again is 604, about the time that Jeremiah is uh, describing these things. 605 was the year that Nebuchadnezzar came through and uh, his father died, Nabopolassar, so he has to take off and head back to the land of Babylon. Takes guys like Daniel. Daniel's back in Babylon. As Jeremiah is prophesying these things, you've got Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2 taking place over in Babylon. And uh, now 604, these are the words to Ammon. Now, a little bit about Ammon. Ammon, here we go. Let's get a map going. Uh, there's the Dead Sea. There's the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee, Jerusalem right here. Then right across here would be the land of Ammon. Moab was down in here. We talked about Moab last week. Edom was down here. From here down to the Gulf of Aquaba would be the land of Edom. Ammon ran this way. This is the land of Gad. Remember one of the tribes of Israel? The land of Gad right here. When Assyria came down and took out northern Israel right here in 721 B.C., Gad was taken captive. And so this land was left vacant. And Ammon kind of just moved up and took part of this land. He's kind of moved up and filled the gap when, when Israel was taken. And during the time of Assyria, when Assyria was ruling and reigning up to this time, from tiglath pileser's time all the way down to, through here, is Ammon prospered as a vassal of the Assyrians and kind of a, just kind of worked with them and they got the trade routes again. There's a trade route that runs right down this side, right through here, that connects the north with the south. And so these, these countries, although they may be in the wilderness or they... And maybe over here, they're going to have some nice cities. They're going to have some very well-established uh, places of water. There's, there's the Jabbok River, or Wadi. It's a river that flows in here, and that would be part of Ammon. There's, there's uh, 
Uh, again, like I say, fertile land, there's, there's valleys there, there's vineyards. So these people are not just living out in the desert. They've got a trade route, they've got nice cities, they've got a water supply here and other places. And so they were, they were prospering during this time. Now, a little bit of history before this. Ammon, uh, way back to the days, just so we know how to get caught up. Back in the days when they asked for a king, when Israel asked for a king, they asked for King Saul, they were afraid of being invaded by, uh, by the, by, from Ammon. And Saul kind of put a stop to that. David sent, uh, Nahash was the king. David sent ambassadors over to recognize, remember the story, recognize the death of the king. And they thought they were being spied on, so they cut the, David's ambassadors, their beards off, and cut holes in their robes, and sent them back, and they were embarrassed, and they stayed at the city of Jericho until their beards grew back. And because of that, that just made David mad. Instead of being diplomatic about it, he just smoked them. He just went over there and killed a bunch of them. Actually made them lay down in a row like this on their, on their, on their faces. And then said, well, we've got to get control of these people, so we'll just kill every, we're going to destroy a third of their population. So count them off, at one, two, three, and kill them. One, two, three, stab. One, two, three, stab. One, two, three. And that was David's form of population control and controlling the people of Ammon. It's like, that's, that's kind of the way that happened there. Of course, he wouldn't get elected here. But, Excuse uh, me, what's the significance of the beards, and why would he cut them off and it was in Over here, when, when he, they went over for Nahash's funeral, his, his people thought they were being spied on, and as an insult, they cut off the beard. Uh, in this time period, build, beards were a sign of manhood. I mean, it was, it was kind of like it indicated you're a man. It wasn't until the coming of Alexander the Great that Alexander the Great kind of figured it out that, you know, if we go to war, because you look at the, the, uh, the, the engravings of Babylonian kings, they're always got the curly beards, or the Assyrian kings, they've got the beards and the long their hair. It's, it's part of their, you know, you look good. It was part of your manhood. Well, in battle, it's just a, it's something to grab a hold of and grab and cut someone's neck. And so Alexander, he had his men coming out of Greece. It's like, man, these guys are easy targets. Let's shave. And then you can, you can see that. You just, in your own minds, you can see that. The Babylonian inscriptions and the Assyrian inscriptions, they've always got beards, sometimes curly beards. But then coming Alexander, it may be got, they may have facial hair, but it's shaved fairly close. And then you got all the Roman emperors, and you don't have any. They're, they're all clean shaven. Julius Caesar, all these guys, Octavian or Augustus Caesar. Uh, it's not until you get to 135, when you get a guy named Hadrian who grows his beard back out when you start seeing, so you got that break right in there. So it's, it was, it, beards were very important at this time in history. It indicated your manhood. And if you wanted to make him look like a boy, you shaved off the beard and sent him home without a beard. That's what we think of you, your little boys go on back home. And they were so embarrassed that David says, you don't need to come home, just stay in Jericho until your beards grow out. And they also cut holes in their, their buttocks. It's, you know, they cut holes in their pants. So they came home with, you know, their, their their rears exposed and, and no beards. And that was enough to get David upset and just destroyed him. So anyway, that's a little bit about the Ammonites there. Um, now, as we continue, what's that? I said, they're glad I asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah good question, good question. Um, in 605, right at this time, Ammon has submitted. So we're in context right now. Ammon saw Babylon coming and they submitted to him. They were part of the, they helped support Babylon when they came against Judah oh, in 597. So when Babylon is coming against during the days, at the, the final days of Jehoiakim, uh, the people of Ammon are over here supporting the battle against J Judah. After Babylon retreats, they switch sides. And there's going to be a time period, and we can read about this in Ezekiel and other places, where the people of Ammon conspire with Judah against Babylon. After the 597 captivity, there's going to be another, Zedekiah is going to come in, we'll talk about this as we go through. And Zedekiah, the king, is going to have this idea because he sees Babylon's kind of stretched out, thinks there's some weaknesses. He gets promise of some Egyptian support, sides up with the Am people of Ammon and Moab. They're going to say, okay, we're with you on this. And that, that's another time where the ambassadors would come over that Jeremiah would have had access to all the leaders of all of these nations in one of these meetings here in Jerusalem. Well, at that time, they were told also, you need to submit to Nebuchadnezzar. But for some reason, everybody agrees to re continue to rebel against him. And that's when Israel is going to be defeated in 586 and, and taken off. Ammon is going to remain there. And when we'll read about this, a guy named Gedaliah is going to be pronounced as the governor of the fallen land of Judah. This is, we're running ahead here a little bit. Gedaliah is going to be put in charge of Jerusalem and Israel under Nebuchadnezzar after 586. But the people of Ammon are going to send people over and have him assassinated, which sends the people of Judah in a turmoil, and that's when they end up running to Egypt and taking Jeremiah with them. 
So that's a little bit about Ammon. They're going to be wise enough to see, uh, to see that they need to support and work with Assyria. They're going to see Assyria fall, and they're going to be wise enough to side with Babylon. But sometime during this time period, after this prophecy, they decide, I think we'll rebel against Nebuchadnezzar along with, with Judah. So here we go. This is Jeremiah in 604 talking to the people of Ammon. Concerning the Ammonites, this is what the Lord says. Has Israel no sons? Has she no heirs? Why then has Molech taken possession of Gad? And remember, this is Jeremiah, or God, chewing out Ammon because when Gad was taken captive by the Assyrians, this is still Israel territory. And he's saying, don't you think we've got enough people that we could occupy that land? This is my land. Again, the Lord considers this his land. I think when you read in the scriptures, we talk about being Israel's land, but God talks to Israel as if it's his land and tells him, you can live in my land if you'll do what's right, but I'll drive you out of my land just like I drove the Canaanites out. And of course, he did that in 586, did that in 70 AD. And if you allow it to th you think this way, that wasn't just a... A, a, a myth or a parable or a poetry or something from the Old Testament, it would appear, if you allow the Bible to be consistent, that, that God still thinks that's his land. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, different people are going to go different ways with this, but the land of Israel, Israel's been set aside for a while, but God still thinks that's his land, if you let the Old Testament speak consistently into the New Testament and today. Which means, when Ammon goes up here and occupies this, it upsets him. And so then you wonder what's going on today in the Middle East, how God's responding to that. Again, now that's getting into some eschatological views right here. And some would say, well, God doesn't care about the land anymore. We're the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God lives in us. And he doesn't even care about the land of Israel. That, that may be true. That's one way of approaching it. But it would appear, if you read the Bible again, literally through it, God is serious about this land, especially the prophecies about Jesus ruling in Jerusalem. Jesus gave the impression he would return and be seated in glory on earth in Jerusalem. And so it appears that there's still a future for the land of Israel. So nonetheless, this is God being in 604, being upset with Ammon for filling the void that was left when Gad was taken captive by the Assyrians or dispersed by the Assyrians. So he says, has Israel no sons? Has she no heirs? Why then has Molech, and Molech is the god of the Ammon. And remember, Chemosh would be the god down here. Molech is one of the gods of, of the end. And so he gives credit, they gave credit to their god for taking it. Why has Molech taken possession of Gad? Why do his people live in its towns? But the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sound the battle cry against Rabbah. And that's the capital city right about here, Rabbah. That's where David sent his ambassadors for Nahash's death. Um, uh, well, so battle cry against Rabbah of the Ammonites. It will become a mound of ruins, and its surrounding villages will be set on fire. Then Israel will drive out those who drove her out, says the Lord. So again, they, they helped drive them out here and help drive out Israel here. Then Israel will drive them out and take control of it again. Uh, Whale, O Hezbon, for Ai is destroyed. Hezbon is one of their, their famous cities. Ai is, it, it, word, word means ruin, but it is not the Ai over here by Jericho. Remember Ai, the city where Joshua attacked and they weren't really ready and they were defeated here? This is another Ai. It's unknown where that's at, but it's probably not this Ai. Cry out, O inhabitants of Rabbah, that's their capital city, put on sackcloth and mourn, that was their sign of mourning. Rush here and there inside the walls, that's them, they're mourning, running around. They realize they're being destroyed, they're mourning and trying to figure out what, how they can get Molech to help them and running around, just, you know, scattering around the city inside the walls, panicking. Rush here and there inside the walls, for Molech will go into exile. They're mourning not before God. They're not putting sackcloth on and mourning to Jehovah, the Lord. They're mourning to their idol, Molech, and they're rushing around the city. When is he going to do something? When is he going to do something? And God says, uh, he's never going to do anything because he's going into exile. You're going to watch your God get carried off into captivity. Why do you boast of your valleys? Boast of your valleys so fruitful. Once again, they were prosperous. They were successful. Again, they weren't just a, a barren desert people. They had civilization. They had cities. They had vineyards. And they had an economy. And they had treaties with Assyria. They had contact with the Babylonians. They had gained possession. You can just hear the political speeches. Well, while during my term as king, we've doubled our possessions. We're now further north up here. And you can see, oh, we've got more vineyards. We're prospering. The, day, the best days are coming. And God is saying, absolutely not. Because you've done this, because you're coming against me, and you're continuing to pursue Molech, 
It, he says, Why do you boast of your valleys, boast of your valleys so fruitful? O oh, unfaithful daughter, you trust in your riches and say, Who will attack me? I've got treaties with Babylon. I've got the trade routes. I'll be able to bribe people. Who will attack me? God says in verse 5, I will bring terror on you. Again, there's Jeremiah's, one of his favorite words, terror. He usually says terror on every side. But he's going to bring terror. And again, that terror is not just destruction. That is the, that fear on the inside as you see the destruction coming and you realize your options are gone. You realize there's no one coming to help us. And you, before you actually are destroyed, you go through that process of being terrorized. And God is promising to bring terror on them. I'll bring terror on you from all those around you, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Again, that's, notice how he describes himself, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Every one of you will be driven away, and no one will gather the fugitives. I mean, you're going to be scattered, and there's not going to be anybody going to bring you back. But here it is. Here's that verse again. Look at verse 6. Yet afterward, I'll restore the fortunes of the Ammonites, declares the Lord. It kind of leaves us hanging where we were last week. With, with Moab, as we look over in verse 47 of chapter 48, yet I will restore the fortunes of Moab in days yet to come. There is that concept that there is something coming in the future. Okay, verse 7. That's Ammon. And we move quickly now down to the land of Edom. And Edom has always been a source of trouble. Here's Jordan, the Dead Sea. Here's Ammon. Here's Moab. Edom. Edom continues all the way down, like I said, to the Gulf of Aquaba, down to the, the Red Sea. Uh, there's this border right here between Judah and Edom, and it, it, it fluctuated at different times. Sometimes they'd move down, sometimes they'd move back up. Just to throw this in here, the Amalekites, we talk about the Amalekites, they moved in this area. They are more, more nomadic, so it's not like the Amalekites lived here or they lived here. These people had cities and fields. Amalekites kind of moved among them at different times, taking advantage of different situations. Now, concerning Edom, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Now, remember where Edom comes from. Edom comes from Esau, and there is strife between Jacob and Esau in their lifetimes back in the book of Genesis, and that strife has continued even to this day. Uh, they, they, they don't like each other. Edom, the book of Obadiah. Obadiah. You're familiar with the very short book of Obadiah. The book of Obadiah is a, a prophet of Judah prophesying against Edom for rejoicing about what takes place in 586 and 597 with Judah. They're rejoicing. He says, don't rejoice over your brother's misfortune. And Edom appears when, when Babylon was destroying Jerusalem and, and the people of Judah were scattering and trying to flee for their lives. Edom was over here blocking roads you know, sending up flares saying, hey, we found a group of Israelis hiding over here. So they're preventing Israel from fleeing. They are siding with the Babylonians, helping them find those who are escaping. And that's going to be the book of Obadiah, is chewing out the people of Edom for rejoicing with the destruction of Judah. It says, your day is coming. And indeed, it did come. So again, there's strife between these two. Now, as you probably know, uh, there's going to arise a, a, a man from Edom. It uh, uh, is going to be Herod. His father is going to be have favor with the Romans, and Herod is going to end up becoming king of, of Judah or Jerusalem, Judah, and uh, that's the, again in the New Testament. But he is descendant of the Edomites, and you can understand why he had some huge political problems in Jerusalem because he is a descendant of Edom. That's why he married Maryam, one of the descendants of the Hasmoneans or the Maccabees. He's trying to marry into the royal line. He would do anything he could. People make fun of Herod and talk about how evil Herod was. And there's a, definitely that side of Herod for a lot of reasons. But Herod would go out of his way to appease these Jewish people. Uh, never put his image on a coin. Never mess with the temple. In fact, he participated and cooperated with them in the temple. Uh, he coupled two different times the nation was going broke. And Herod, out of his own finances, helped bring the, bring the society back. Now, that's the guy you want to vote for president. A man who says, well, I know we're in trouble economically, but hey, I've got it this year. No taxes, I'll just cover the bill. And brought in food from Egypt at his own expense to feed the people. Twice he went broke, saving his country from his own checkbook, but then made all that money back up with trade on these caravan routes. So that is a little bit about, that's way off subject, but uh, he does, I could tell you a couple other things about that. I will tell you one more thing just because it's interesting. Harry gets his money from these trade routes coming down the, the highway, the King's Highway or the Coastal Plain. 
and there's bandits. They'd rob, you know, you get these caravans out in the middle of nowhere between two locations, and bandits would rob the, chair, the, the caravans. And so what he would do, he established a smoke signal system from hills. It's like we read in, in uh, the, the notes I handed to you about when uh, 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 Azika could see that Lakish was burning. You remember those notes in the pot shirt? They could, they could see the smoke signals. There were smoke signals that they could communicate. So as these caravans would travel, Herod would know exactly, they could single, signal back to him exactly how the, if they arrived on time, if they arrived on time, how the caravans were going. So it really made it impossible to move about the land of Judah without Herod knowing where you were and how the caravan routes were coming. You understand the story right now, you understand the concept. He needed to do that because bandits would continually raid him and he was a very wealthy man, spent his money twice to save Israel. Now, with that background, what's interesting about that, with that background, Coming out of the east are the wise men that show up in Jerusalem, walk into the palace, address the king, go to Bethlehem because he says that's where the scribe says the Messiah would be born, and they are, do you think they're being watched? Herod's already killed one of his own sons because he thought he was trying to be, because he was the son of Maryam, who was one of the Hasmonean princesses. And so he thought maybe his son would have a play on him in publicly uh, public sentiment. We would be, get elected or get you know a, a military support. So he'd already killed one of his sons because he felt threatened. So you know he was watching these wise men in this land where he had eyes everywhere. And then the Magi have a dream, and they went back another way. Maybe they went around here, or they possibly because of the dry that there's that that isthmus right here where that they could. And it's not called isthmus, but there's a List Bun or whatever it's called, you could cross here. Sometimes when it was low, the water was low. But the point I'm trying to make very quickly is the wise men vaporized five miles south of Jerusalem, and Herod didn't know, didn't know where they went, which is pretty amazing when he could keep track of these caravans, knew exactly where they were, and all of a sudden they just, they're just gone, which adds a little bit to that story. Okay, way too much information for the book of Jeremiah. Edom, right here. Dead Sea, Jerusalem. Here's that border. Okay, Edom. Concerning Edom, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Is there no longer wisdom in Teman? And Teman would be the capital, one of the capital. Basra is one of the capital cities. Remember, Jesus comes striding forth from Basra and Isaiah when he returns. Teman is another one of their major cities. And it is known that there is wisdom down here. Now, down here in Edom, they, they've got a lot of mountains, the rough uh, Petra, you know, you know, okay, Indiana Jones, there's that scene in Indiana Jones, that's down here in Petra, the rock cities, they, they live in the, the cliffs, they've carved houses up in there, and so they had a lot of protection in these cities, in, in the rocks, uh, there was also known to have wisdom down there, the different things they would have, they were not, again, a backwards people, they were very successful as a people, these are the descendants of Esau, which are the descendants of Abraham, I mean, they were already successful when Esau went down there and settled, so they're not like some, you know, cave dwellers, although they lived in rocks, but they, you go, go look at them today, there's still beautiful carvings in the rocks where they live. In some, in some situations, but they still have cities. Okay. Uh, is there no longer wisdom in Teman? Has consul perished from the prudent? In other words, Jeremiah or God is mocking him. It's like, where's all your wise men? You haven't figured this out. I thought you guys had some wisdom. Has, has consul perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? Turn and flee. Hide in deep caves. Again, remember they lived in the rocks. You who live in Dedan. There's another one of their cities. And all these can be identified where they're at. There's remains in all of them. For I will bring disaster on Esau. Why Esau? That's where they come from. At the time I will punish him. If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? He says if you had grape pickers come through, would they get every grape? No, they'd leave a few. In fact, that was part of the law. You'd always leave a little bit of your crop in the field for the poor to come by and pick it up. If you harvested everything, you're a greedy person. Leave some there on the corners so the poor people can have a little bit of your harvest. That was just the way the law was. But he even saying here, if grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? They're not going to get every last grape. If thieves came during the night, would they not steal only as much as they wanted or only as much as they could carry away? But I will strip Esau bare. He says, you're going to wish you had great pickers. You're going to wish you'd been attacked by a thief because they're always going to leave something behind. But he says, I'm going to attack you. And when I get done, there won't be any grapes left. There won't be anything left in your houses. I'm going to strip you 
bear. I'm the, I'm the worst thief you can imagine, in a sense he's, he's referring to. But I will strip Esau bare. I will uncover his hiding places, all the places they think they can go hide, so that he cannot conceal himself. There's When I get ready to move on to Edom, he says, there's nowhere for you to hide. His children, relatives, and neighbors will perish, and he will be no more. Leave your orphans. I will protect their lives. Your widows, too, can trust me. Interesting right there. He says, I'm going to, everyone's going to perish or everyone's going to be found, but leave your orphans. I will protect their lives. Your widows, too, can trust in me. This is what the Lord says. If those who do not deserve to drink the cup must drink it, why should you go unpunished? You will not go unpunished, but must drink it. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that Basra, that's one of their main, main cities, will become a ruin and an object of horror of reproach and of cursing and all its towns will be ruins forever. And again, if you go down in here, there's never really been a great revival of these, these people down here after, after Babylon came through and swept through there. Uh, there's been nomads, there's been people that lived down in there, used the fields and stuff, but no, no society has risen. And again, remember, these were successful societies. Um, goes on and says this, um, verse 14, I have heard a message from the Lord. Jeremiah is speaking. I have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Assemble yourselves to attack it. Rise up for battle. In other words, Jeremiah says, I have heard an envoy, a messenger go to the other nations or the other troops, a messenger from Nebuchadnezzar, say, Okay, assemble yourselves. It's time to destroy Edom. He says, I have heard that. Now, verse 50, Now I will make you small among the nations, despised among men. The terror you inspire and the pride of your heart have deceived you. So again, they have some kind of power here that they can terrorize, and they are going to help Babylon oppress Judah at different times. And notice here, the terror they inspire. Because they can impress people or they can terrorize people, they have some confidence. And the pride of your heart, because they begin to think we are more than we are, and right there it says it, has deceived you. And that is always a problem. If you want to talk about just the human experience, when you start looking out at certain things and you start letting pride you know, dwell, it's one thing to be impressive or terrorizing people, but then allow pride to deceive you and warp that image. Make yourself look better than you really are to your own eyes. You'll be deceived and you'll start trying to do things you can't really do. You can see that at different kings. Uh, uh, what's the word? I just, uh, just forgot the word. It's that arrogant pride. Uh, I'll think of it here in a minute. Uh, it, it, what? Pride. No, not pride. It's it's a more. Uh, I'll think of it here in a minute. Uh, but it's it's that that pride of arrogance that makes you extend your ability. The worst thing a leader can have is overconfidence and pride, and they start doing things they can't handle. They get themselves too far extended. I almost thought of it right there. Okay, but anyway, I'll read on. Now I will make you small among the nations, despise among men. The terror you inspire and the pride of your hearts have deceived you. you. You think too highly of yourself and you're going to get in trouble. You who live in the clefts of the rocks, that would be, for example, down by Petra, who occupy the heights of the hill, though you build your nest as high as the eagles, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. You, because you're up there and you think, oh, no one can get up here, he says, I'm going to bring you down. The very fact you've got pride makes you weak. Uh, Proverbs, pride comes before a fall. Same idea. Verse 17, Edom will become an object of horror. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of all its wounds. Verse 18, as Sodom and Gomorrah were overthrown, Sodom and Gomorrah right in this area. Again, realize to us it's a legend, it's a story, it's not true, who knows if it really happened. To them, that was part of their history. They knew these, these things were true. Esau would, would have been a child and would have been a man knowing that these things were there still remains of them there. In fact, we can still excavate and there's some things that they've discovered that are very interesting. But for these people, Sodom and Gomorrah was not a legend or a myth or, or some you know, illustration. It was an actual place that had been destroyed. I'll tell you this very quickly too. The Dead Sea right here, this part of the Dead Sea, this is steep or deep water right here. This part is shallow water, the bottom third. And when you go in there and excavate it, and you can read about this in different books and archaeology and stuff, that down here, there's full, there's large trees here, and it appears that this was a fertile, there's no cities here. There's no cities. Sodom and Gomorrah are not here. There's no cities underneath here. But there are trees, there are fields that have been planted there. It looked like a, a plain. Now you read in Genesis, when it talks about a lot 
Abraham separated, and Lot looked this way and saw it was well watered like Egypt, like the Garden of God. Egypt is watered from the Nile, not because of rainwater, from the Nile River that waters Egypt. And what do they use? They use irrigation. They irrigate out of the river. And this right here would have been irrigated, it looks like, would have been irrigated. There's no buildings there, but trees, and it had been irrigated. And this right here, it appears that during the destruction, there was some kind of an explosion. It talks about the tar pits and all the petroleum. And even there, there's still remains of it. That there was a, a something that exploded. If it would be a bolt of lightning, whatever, it exploded and rained down all the petroleum. Fire and brimstone came down, and what exploded out caused this to sink down, and water covered this up right here. It's not the same. This this is not the same as this. It's not the same lake. This is a, a deep, the Dead Sea, but water filled in and covered this up. So again, there, that was all part of their history. So when Jeremiah says this, you know, for us, it's like, well, Sodom and Gomorrah, who knows if it really happened? Well, I think it really did. I think, again, we're reading the book of Genesis as a historical narrative. But he says right here, um, Verse 17, Edom will become an object of horror. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of all its wounds. As Sodom and Gomorrah were overthrown along with their neighboring towns. That's right out of Genesis. So no one will live there. No man will dwell in it. This area here is, it has been shut down. This area is going to be shut down. No one will live in it. Verse 19, like a lion coming up from Jordan's thickets to a rich pasture land, I will chase Edom from its land in an instant. Uh, again, this is again uh, the ideal of, of being destroyed. Up here, the, the thickets of the Jordan, a lot of brush and a lot of trees. There were lions that lived in here. When they'd come up and start chasing something, the hunt's on. And God is saying the same thing. Just like a lion comes up out of the Jordan thickets and attacks, he says, that's what's going to happen to you. Um, I will chase Edom from its land as a, in an instant. Who is... The chosen one I will appoint for, me, for this. Who is like me and who will challenge me? In other words, none. Who is going to do this? Let me go back and read this again. I will chase Edom from its land in an instant. I mean, all of a sudden, it's just going to be a matter of days and they're going to be just swept away. Who is the chosen one I will appoint for this? And I think the point here is me. He's saying, not, not me, Galen, but he's saying myself. Who is the one I'm going to appoint to do this? I'm going to do it. Who is like me and who can challenge me? None. I am the best. So I'm going to call upon myself to do this. In other words, he's saying it's not Nebuchadnezzar, it's not Sennacherib, it's not, it's like I will do this personally. Who's better to do it than me? I'm your biggest fear. Verse 20, therefore, hear what the Lord has planned against Edom, what he has purposed against those who live in Teman. Again, one of their leading cities. What he has purposed against those living in Teman. The young of the flock will be dragged away. He will completely destroy their pasture because of them. Remember, he started off saying, if you had thieves coming, something would be left behind. If they're harvesting grapes, something would be left behind. But no, I'm going to do this myself. Who's better qualified to destroy you than me? So I will do it, and I'll completely destroy you. I'll completely destroy your pasture because of them. At the sound of their fall, the earth will tremble. Their cry will resound to the Red Sea. Again, the Red Sea is down here. And the world is going to hear of Edom's fall. Reports are going to reach Edom, Egypt and beyond. And they're going to be like, look at what has happened to Edom. Because people know who Edom is. Why do people know who Edom is? We don't know who Edom is. But the, the, the spice routes came right through this area of Edom. Part of their prosperity was the trade routes. And when they fall and people, traders come in, they're going to be like getting out of the way here as these guys are being destroyed. And word is going to spread to the east. It's going to spread to the north and the west. It's going to spread to the south. Guess what happened in Egypt? Because everybody, or Edom, everybody passes through here. The king's route passed here. The coastal plain went down here. They would connect with it. They went down into Egypt. It was a huge place as far as caravans. So everyone's going to hear about this. Uh, verse 22, look, an eagle will soar and swoop down, spreading its wings over Basra. Who is this eagle? I'm going to say I think it would be Nebuchadnezzar. An eagle will soar and swoop down, spreading its wings over Basra. In the day that the hearts of Edom's warriors will be like the heart of a woman in labor, meaning completely paralyzed and waiting for the results to take place. There, there's nothing they can do except, except wait. They're just paralyzed with, with patience, or not patience, but with the fear of waiting. Okay, that ends our discussion about Edom. So we talked about Ammon. Last week we talked about Moab and Egypt. Now we talked about Edom. Galen, what's the purpose, do you feel, for verse number 11, 
where it says, leave your orphans behind and I will take care of them. I mean, it sounds to me like uh, from that that he's just going to pick on the men. Right. But it doesn't sound to me like when he deals with the land that there's going to be any place for anybody to be. I, I'm not sure where, how, that, how that breaks down. I don't have any insight of that right now. Except it sounds, it sounds hopeful. It sounds, sounds like the Lord, instead of just slaughtering innocent people, uh, leave your orphans, I will protect their lives. Uh, your widows, too, can trust in me. So apparently there's going to be, he had some plan of maybe they're taken captive and absorbed in another culture, uh, something that they're going to be, I do not know. I think we could get some study, could, someone's got more insight of that, I'm sure we could find something. I don't have anything. Does anybody have a good footnote in their study Bibles on verse 11 in, in chapter 49? Anything? I, I don't, my NIV Bible just skips it right here, my footnotes. Although I read more than my NIV footnotes for study. I will try and look that up because I thought the same thing. Okay. Okay, we got now Damascus. Here's uh, Dead Sea, Jordan River, Galilee. Here's Jerusalem. Up here would be Damascus. That's where that's going to be part of Syria or Aram, as it's going to be called at that time. Uh, south of that would be again the land of Israel. You've also got over here Lebanon, over here on the coast. But anyway, Damascus. Concerning Damascus, Hamath and Arpad are dismayed, for they have heard bad news. And the bad news is, remember, Edom's down here, Moab's down here, Ammon's down here, Judah's down here, Egypt's down here. And for Nebuchadnezzar to get here, he's going to come down from the north. This is the way they'd come. They'd come through the desert this way and come down. That's why the invasion always comes from the north. And so if these people aren't going to fall, uh, Damascus or the Arameans are going to have Nebuchadnezzar at least passing through somehow. So here it is. They are disheartened, be, the, troubled like a restless sea. Damascus has become feeble. She has turned to flee, and panic has gripped her. Anguish and pain have seized her, pain like that of a woman in labor. Why has the city of Renoan not been abandoned, the town in which I delight? Surely her young men will fall in the streets. All of her soldiers will be silenced in that day, declares the Lord Almighty. I will set fire to the walls of Damascus. I will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. That's the king. Several times Ben-Hadad pops up if it's being with the days of uh, uh, Ahab or, or later, and here again, Ben-Hadad is their king. So again, just an announcement that Damascus and the Arameans will be, will be destroyed there. Now we continue, verse 28. Uh, concerning Keter and the kingdom of Hazor, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked. Now these would be Hazor would be right up in here. That's the city. Joshua took that. Uh, and destroy it, but again, it was re right away by the days of uh, Deborah, it was re-inhabited by the Canaanites, and from there they oppressed uh, Sisera and his iron chariots, oppressed the people of Naphtali up in this area here. And that's when Deborah sends uh, Barak, uh, Barak up to fight these people. So Hazor was destroyed by Joshua. It was an ancient city. Those of us that were there this summer, standing right here, uh, talking to uh, Ben Tor, the ar archaeologist that you look him up, he's famous. He worked with, uh, 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 J J what's his name? Uh, oh, I just forgot his name, too. The great one from the 60s, the great archaeologist from the 60s. Never mind. But anyway, talk, he was talking to, to us, and you can read it online in different places, how important the city of Hazor was because it's mentioned, going back into ancient, you know, 2000 BC, it's mentioned in archives found in other places that Hazor, because that's the entrance into this land right here. And so, okay, what they're saying is they're looking for an archive. They have not found the royal archive in Hazor. They found the palace. They found a variety of other places. They found the worship center. But they believe that there has to be an archive. When they uncover it, they're going to find the library with all kinds of new cuneiform writings or documents that will give us even more insight. Because they found over here and up here in Asia Minor from the, uh, uh, from the book of Genesis, the Hittites. The Hittite Empire, they found the, not scrolls, but the, uh, the, the clay tablets with the cuneiform writing, and they mention Hazor. <laughs> Egypt mentions Hazor, and, or Hazor. I think they're supposed to say it Hazor, I say it Hazor. I'm not sure where they get the T, probably some linguistic thing I should know. But anyway, that's a very famous city, very important city. Here it is. Concerning Keter and the kingdoms of Hazor, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked. This is what the Lord says. Arise and attack Keter. Destroy the people of the east. Again, these are the cities that would extend. Keter and Hazor would extend up into this area. 
Their tents and their flocks will be taken, their shelters will be carried off with all their goods and camels. Men will shout to them, terror on every side. There it is again. Flee quickly away. Stay in the deep caves, you who live in hate, or declares the Lord. Your best hope is just to hide in the hole in the ground as Nebuchadnezzar passes by. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has plotted against you. He has devised a plan against you. That's part of when he didn't have his meetings and stuff. He had a whole strategy of just walking around attacking. He would have strategies of when to attack, where to attack, how many people to use. He's got a strategy against Hazor, and he's, they're just being told by Jeremiah. Nebuchadnezzar's got you in, their, in your sights. Uh, Arise and attack a nation at ease, which lives in confidence, declares the Lord. They were right there on the border with Assyria. They, they benefited from trade. They would think, hey, we're going to be fine. We can get a, navigate our way through this. Uh, but a nation that has neither gates nor bars, its people live alone. Their camels will become plunder, and their large herds will be booty. I will scatter to the winds those who are in distant places and will bring disaster on them from every side, declares the Lord. Hazor will become a haunt of jackals, a desolate place forever. And we should mention there, since we were there this summer, not just jackals there, but there's vipers there also. We had, we had a viper crawl through our group and just scattered everybody, even uh, Ben Torrey, the guy that was excavating there. He got, in fact, they got it on video. You look at that on video. So, but anyway. Hazor become a haunt of jackals, a desolate place forever. No one will live there. No man will dwell in it. And that would end this settlement right here. Now, again, it's a great place to art excavate. They'll be excavating there forever. I mean, there's so many layers there and so spread out. Uh, there'll, there'll always be people excavating at Hazor if they can get the funding and, you know, get the, everybody lined up. Anyway, that's, I'm reading through these fairly quickly, but understand, these people, most likely, the people of Hazor, are going to have this copy of Jeremiah somewhere in their library, in their archive at that time. And they're going to have to have read it. They're going to have to deal with it. There may be set aside, say, I don't believe it, but they'll probably keep it for some reason, at least for some kind of reference. You know, how to kill Jeremiah or something. So these people, these people up here, Damascus, Ammon, Moab, they're all going to have to have read this and watch these things take place as, it's not Jeremiah, but the Lord himself tells them, this is your fate. Read it, believe it if you want to. Deal with it if you want to, or burn it if you want to. But I've told you what your fate is at this time in history. Very interesting that Jeremiah, that's his job, is to announce to these nations what their fate is. Uh, we continue now to the east. Hazor, Kedar, over Elam. We continue over towards Babylon, towards that area. Here's one to Elam. This is the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord, I'm in verse 34 of chapter 49. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah, the prophet concerning Elam, early in the reign of Zedekiah. Okay, so right here, we're talking 604 up until this point, okay? But now, 604, we've got Jeho Jehoiakim on the throne. Zedekiah is not going to come on the throne until 597, right around that time period. And so we're going to make a jump. This right here, this, this verse is not attached with the rest of these scriptures. It was going to be placed there off of a different, another scroll. But I'm going to read it so we get through this. Uh, I may jump into it later sometime. But this will probably be around 596. Um, yeah, I've got a note here. In 596, that is when the, this area, Elam, up in this area here, was attacked by Nebuchadnezzar and finished off. I'm going to read this. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam early in the reign of Zedekiah, which would begin in 597. This is what the Lord Almighty says. See, I will attack the bow of Elam, the mainstay of their might. I will bring against Elam the four winds from the four quarters of the heavens. The four winds, now what would that represent? You've got the four horsemen at different times. You've got in, in Zechariah, you've got the, the four horsemen there also, or the four winds that are coming. In the days of Daniel, as Daniel's prophesying at this very time, talking about the four winds of heaven coming together, and as they, they would meet, they'd cause a kind of a turmoil, and they're stirring up the sea. In Daniel, those four winds were some kind of a spiritual force that were stirring up the sea, which probably was not the Mediterranean Sea, but a representation of the nations that were being stirred up. And as Daniel's talking about the sea being stirred up with, with, the, with the four winds, that's what's happening here. And this is what there, he says right here, verse 36, I'll bring against Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. They're going to be swept up in the storm that Jeremiah is prophesying about. The nations are going to be all uh, uh, turned around and, and torn down and rebuilt. I'll scatter them to the four winds, and there will not be a nation where Elam's exiles do not go. Very interesting. 
They're going to be scattered so far to every different place. They're not just going to go to Babylon. They're going to be scattered everywhere. I will shatter Elam before their foes, before those who seek their lives. I'll bring disaster upon them, even my fierce anger, declares the Lord. I'll pursue them with the sword. This is something he also promises Israel when he scatters them to another country. He'll pursue them into that country until I've made an end of them. In his case right here, he wants to destroy all the descendants of, of Elam. I'll set my throne in Elam and destroy her king and her officials, declares the Lord. Yet I will restore the fortunes of Elam in days to come. Again, a, an eschatological promise that all of this, although it gets scattered, it's interesting, although these nations get scattered and pushed aside, removed from history, this chapter, these chapters here, are not done yet. Not just as Israel coming back, but something is going to take place or these things are going to be brought back together and, and the final fulfillment is, is brought about. That ends chapter 49. Chapter 50 is going to come later on. Uh, chapter 50, notice it says it's a message to Babylon. We'll read that uh, uh, later on. That's towards uh, uh, the end, probably around 593 is when Bab this verse is going to be given. And it's going to involve, it's going to involve Bar Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe, Baruch's brother, I was like Sierra or something like that, I can't remember his name, is going to be given the scroll that Jeremiah, this Babylonian passage is going to be prophesied to Baruch to be written down, put on a scroll, given to his brother to take to Babylon to try and find somebody to pay attention to it, then he's going to just throw it into the, the Euphrates River so that this sinks there. So it's a testimony to Babylon too. I've already put the word there saying what's going to take place, I've already declared it. If nothing else is taking place right here, these nations are being told. In fact, I want to end by just going back to Jeremiah chapter 1. Some of these cities don't say that they are the story of fortune. Things become so hard, like Damascus. Right. And some of those are, will never come back. That's that's something to be, to be alert to. It appears that some are going to be removed and never return, and others, there's some kind of a promise. And again, it's kind of hanging in that, that balance of well, how is that going to be fulfilled. I know when you read about people coming out of Egypt, a lot of times when Jesus returns, uh, you know, in the, in the setting up of the millennium, people are going to go off and bring people from these nations to worship the Lord. It talks about that in Isaiah and Jeremiah. So a lot of them are going to have believers that are going to be coming from. Maybe it's, I mean, if you put it, think if you overlay that prophecy, if you overlay these prophecies with the Middle East today and then put that into an eschatological sense that we're living in the final days, and we may be, we may not be, that's always a question. That would mean these would all be Muslim states today. These are today. If you're going to say this is going to happen today, if this is going to happen in our lifetime, all these nations are, are Muslim. And they're going to be coming from those Muslim nations to worship, and God's going to be dealing with them. And again, it's kind of hard, you know, to you know for us to accept that sometimes because you know, you know, they're the enemy, they're Muslims, and we're Christians and we're Western. But it's interesting when you when you step back and look at it from God's view, those those are also the people that God's working on and calling. I mean, they're closer to the to the, the land of the scriptures than we are over here on the other side of the world. So almost we're like way out of touch and they're right there in the midst of it. So again, not saying that that's what's going to take place, just that if this all comes down in our lifetime and these are all in a sense rebuilt and, and they come to the Lord, it's going to be Muslim nations. Yes, Sherry? Back to this question about verse 11. Yes. I have a, little, I have a short footnote. It says, why not wipe them all out like other Right. So, yeah, right there without that end point, without us really understanding why, God does have a reason. These are going to be destroyed, but I will spare these. Compared to like when they came into jo uh, Joshua came into the land of Canaan, destroy everybody, men, women, and children. It's like, now that's it's just a different. It's not just a random wrath of God. Everything had if it's random wrath, there's a reason for it. Otherwise, he's picking and choosing as he again makes him makes him intelligent, makes him just and, and, and reasonable as he's going through. Okay. Doesn't doesn't <clears throat> as we get further into Revelations and so forth, aren't all of the <coughs> Uh, Muslim countries, don't they come 
together to go after Jerusalem, and God eliminates all of them. Right. Well, uh, what you're looking at there is in, in, is in, in Ezekiel with uh, 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 Gog and Magog and those nations. All those nations that join with Gog and Magog are all are all terrorist states, not just Muslim nations, but they're all terrorist states today. Which again really leans heavy that we're man, we're like right on the verge of this. But that's who knows. But it would really seem to because those and those nations are destroyed, indeed. Um, but yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean every last person needs to be destroyed as much as their their political power, their government is broken and, and people will come out. Yeah, when you, and you see, that's what we talked about last night, all the little puzzle pieces. If you, if, if you just have about six verses on eschatology, man, you, anybody can teach eschatology. When we start getting all these verses from Jeremiah and all those verses from Ezekiel and have to throw those into the pot too, now you don't have a six-piece puzzle. You've got one of those 10,000-piece small jigsaw puzzles all painted white. It's like, well, how are we going to figure this out? And that's, it's, it's a lot more difficult. So the more you put these things in, it's easy just to dismiss all these things and say, we've got our six verses, this is how it's going to happen. We put all this stuff together. It's all got to fit somehow, and it all kind of works off of each other. So you just got to be patient and just kind of continue to study. So yeah, yeah, you're right, because we talk about these nations, guys, in, in the future days, but yet in Ezekiel it makes it very clear, they'll be, those nations will be destroyed, and then the, all their weapons will be used for seven years. You know, what's that talking about? Israel will use it for seven years. That leads right in the temple being rebuilt in, in Ezekiel, so. Okay. Uh, you were going to go to chapter I'm in chapter one, one of Jeremiah. I just want to look at this and, and remind us of this. Chapter one, verse four. Uh, this is when God called Jeremiah. And the reason we spent time looking at those verses is because those verses, although they're, they're just random, not random, but I mean just every nation is just getting destroyed by, by God's judgment. That was the purpose of Jeremiah. Here we go, chapter 1, verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah says, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And here's what it is. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So Jeremiah is not just a prophet to Jehoiakim or Zedekiah or just a prophet to Judah right here. This right here, those chapters we just read, are the fulfillment of Jeremiah's ministry. And that's why they were recorded. That's why they were inserted in the book because that was what God called him in chapter 1. If you go through the whole book of Jeremiah and you never hear him talking to the nations, it's like, you're not a prophet to the nations. You never even dealt with them. But Jeremiah deals with every nation from Egypt off to Babylon, down to Edom, up to Damascus, into Syria. He's talking about all of these nations. Not in a necessarily a prophetic sense about the distant future, like maybe Ezekiel or even Isaiah might do. He's talking right now. I mean, he's like front page of the newspaper. 604 and by 597, these things are taking place. By 586, they're sweeping through. By the time he's dead, all of his prophecies, almost all of his prophecies have come to pass before Jeremiah dies. So he wasn't an eschatological preacher, per se, or an eschatological figure talking about the distant future, as much as he was a political uh, columnist, a, a political talk show host, a political telling people, this is what's going on in, in your culture, and I'm making these announcements. So it's just kind of interesting how you look at Jeremiah, put him in his contemporary setting. And then I'll say this, and I'll be done unless you have some more questions or comments. Um, these nations, these nations have to hear the word of God from Jeremiah, the prophet of God from, from Israel. Because God is moving through Israel at this time in history, during the, the time of Israel. There's not a prophet of God over in Babylon or a prophet of God in Ezekiel. There may be believers, but the prophets come from Israel. That was his client nation. Now you say, well, yeah, but what about Balaam? Balaam was a prophet from up north, up by the Euphrates. Right, but that was before Israel was established as a nation. That was during the days of Moses. They're still on their way back. So they're being established. So there were prophets before that time that were from the Gentile nations, but it would appear, at least my bet as you put this together, the reason guys are like guys Jeremiah or, or a Jonah, Jonah has to go up to Nineveh and preach because he's a prophet to the nations. God is going to speak to the world through Israel up until the time of the church when the Holy Spirit comes upon the church and now we have the ministry of proclaiming the truth and you know if we have the prophecies or whatever, if that would be taking place as another whole conversation, but it would come through the church. But it's interesting right here, God is moving through Israel, that's why Jeremiah was called to do that job. 
Okay, I'm going to quit. Are there any questions or thoughts or insights? I appreciate your input on this, and I appreciate your patience on going through these, these difficult chapters. You could sum it up by simply saying, God is going to destroy these nations, and we're done. You know, But it's kind of fun to see. I, really, I think it's important to see and hear the voice of God as He speaks to these. It's like, this is what He's saying. It really helps you balance out when you hear God talking today. Or when I say hear God talking, but when you hear people present about God today. Uh, I'll say this very quickly again, trying to wrap it up. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, he's talking about, and I put this on a, one of those devotions, I just, that's why I just did this week, probably about three days ago. But in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, he refers to a bunch of situations in Israel's past, talking about the, the Exodus generation and different situations. And he says, these things were written as examples and warnings for us on whom the fullness of the age has come. If you think you stand firm, be careful that you do not fall. That word be careful is a word that means take a look, look at and see. And when he says be careful that you do not fall, in the context he's saying, what are you going to be careful of? What are you looking for? What, what he just told you. These things were written down as examples and warnings for us. Be careful that you do not fall. Look that you don't, look at what? Look at this. Look at the Old Testament. Look at this, these examples in the Old Testament so you do not fall. Because you're out here living the Christian life and you're trying to walk this Christian life and try to find out what God wants and how God is and who He is. It's like, okay, got a little confusion? Look at these examples. Look at these warnings. They're there for us. It's like what we just read. Like I said, you hear the voice of God talking to Ammon, to Edom. You hear the judgment, but you also hear, in future days, I'll restore you. You hear why he's upset. He's upset with Ammon for going up and taking the land of Gath. That wasn't your land. That's my land for my people. You're, it's like God's paying attention to land. It's like, yes, so you get to hear his voice. And Paul's saying there, not just the story of Samson and Noah and David and Goliath that everybody knows from Sunday school. It's that voice of God in the Old Testament. These things were written as examples and warnings for us on whom the fullness of the ages has come. If we're, and here, my point. If we're going to mature, if we're going to know God, you have to know the examples and the warnings in the Old Testament. You have to know His voice. Otherwise, like Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they recognize it. They know my voice. And His voice comes right out of the Old Testament. Jesus is the manifestation. He is the Son of God who appeared in the Old Testament. It's the same person. We're not Gnostics. We don't have a God of wrath in the Old Testament and a God of grace and mercy in the New Testament. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. How have we ever heard your voice before? Well, have you ever read the Old Testament? I flooded the earth after I created it. I called Abram. I, I did these things. That was my voice. He, Jesus says to his, the people, he says, uh, the scribe says, Abram saw my day and rejoiced. Abram knew my voice. If you loved Abraham, if you knew Abraham, you'd rejoice to see me too. But apparently, you don't know what I said in the Old Testament because you weren't were familiar with it. So once again, just a little plug for knowing the Old Testament because it was written down as examples and warnings for us of whom the fullness of the ages has come. And if we want to make sure that we don't fall, we need to continue to see that and stare at the Old Testament. Not saying we're going to go back under the law. I didn't say that. I says that's where the examples of the voice of God is. It's the same voice throughout the Scriptures. Okay, I'm done. I'm going to quit. And next week we'll get back to some of the uh, uh, the storyline of, of, the, of, of the book of Jeremiah instead of just the, the wrath and judgment of all the nations. I do appreciate your patience of, of going through this. Father, we do thank you again for the chance to be here. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We do ask that we may hear these things, that we would take them to heart, and that we would, again, become the people you've called us to be at this time in history. Again, Father, I thank you for this nation, and I ask for uh, your hand upon our country this evening and in the future, future months and years, again, that we may see revival, that we may do the work that you've called us to as a church and as individuals. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank Amen. you so much. Thank you.